and welcome to my review of the XT3. My name is Jet Madsen and right now I'm up in the Norwegian mountains shooting some b-roll and some test clips for this review. This is actually the XH1 but the XT3 is filming me right now together with the Ninja V Atomos recorder. Fujifilm Nordic was so kind to lend me this uh, XT3 and some great lenses for this review but I'm in no way paid or sponsored so the opinion on this camera is strictly my own. So, let's do a short summary of what we're going to see in this review. Of course, we have to look at the specs and highlights of this camera. Image samples from 4K 60p, comparison of 120p on the X-T3 versus the X-H1. We will have a look at 8-bit versus 10-bit and explaining the differences and how they both perform when grading the video. We will have a look at the color profiles, rolling shutter, autofocus, face detection autofocus, we will look at computer performance when editing H.265 versus H.264, file size for 4K 60p recording internally versus externally, crop factors, F-log recording and much more. But first off, some test shots graded to Malaki. Let's first have a short look at the specs and the highlights of the Fujifilm X-T3. This review is, as the video description says, all about the video side of this camera. But I still hope the still shooters also will find this review helpful. 
the biggest news on this camera and what Fujifilm surprised us all with is the 4K 60p recording. But not only that, it does it in 10 bit also internally. That's something never seen before at this price point, except maybe the Panasonic GH5, which only shoots 4K 60p 8 bit internally. 4K 60p is also available in 4K DCI at the 17 to 9 ratio. In addition, it can record a bitrate up to 400 megabit per second in all intra. All intra means all the frames are recorded as is, in contradiction to long gap, which you have to use in 4K 60p. Long gap only records the differences between the frames, not all the info in each frame. This can be more stressful on your computer when editing, but the file size are smaller. In 4K 60p, you can record as mentioned up to 200 megabit per second internally, but it's possible to record 400 megabit externally. The chroma subsampling is 42 internally or 42 externally via HDMI. So, what's the difference between 8 bit and 10 bit? Frankly, if you don't edit your video at all, shoot at 8 bit. Most devices only display 8 bit anyhow. In 8-bit there is 256 levels of each color, so 256 red, 256 green and 256 blue variations. If you divide them, you get roughly 16.8 million combinations in total. That might sound like a lot, but if you start to stretch those values a lot, you will start to see color banding, blocking and noise. In 10 bits, the value is multiplied by 4, that's 1024 values for red, green and blue or a whopping 1 billion total combinations. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. First, we have a plain 10-bit video shot in 4K, eternal color profile. If we throw on a quite extreme curve, the sky holds up pretty well. Maybe we see some noise, but nothing disturbing, but still quite an extreme curve. So if we copy the same curve over to an 8-bit video, still 4K Eterna with the same settings, we see color banding and noise appearing almost all over the sky. This is, as I said, an extreme curve, but the demonstration of the differences you will see when editing quite hard. Here is one more example. Pushing the blue color, saturation and luminosity. Shooting blue skies and adjusting the blues is often something that can give problems in an 8-bit video. Here you can see there is some noise in the transition from the blue to the white skies. But if you do the exact same adjustment in an 8-bit video, there is definitely more noise and pretty much color banding. This grading is not usable on an 8-bit video in my opinion. So 10-bit really have an advantage if you grade your video. There is a new image sensor on the X-T3, the new 26 megapixel BSI X-Trans CMOS 4 sensor. A BSI sensor is a backside illuminated sensor, meaning all the wiring and circuitry that's used to carry the electronic signals from each photo site or pixels is located at the back of the sensor instead of in the front, which again leads to more light being able to reach the photo sites. And this in return means the image being captured needs less amplification. The X-T2 has the older 24.3 megapixel X-Trans CMOS 3 sensor. The X-T3 has face detection AF points nailed to the entire frame now it's 2.16 million face detection pixels. The low light AF sensitivity has also been extended from minus one EV to minus three EV. Uh, this improves the low light focus abilities quite noticeably. The X-T3's quad core processor really can calculate a lot of data compared to the older processors. And I have so far not experienced any issues with overheating as cameras like this can experience. There is a lot of heat generated from all this data being processed. I have found the focus to be very reliable, even faster and more precise than the X-H1 with the latest firmware. The face and eye detection autofocus also works great, especially if there is only one face in the scene. If it loses the face, it goes back to the last selected focus point. If you're not shooting people, I recommend turning it off, as it sometimes, but not often, can think it sees a face when it actually isn't. But in general, it works great and I would say it's on par with the best cameras out there. The autofocus speed and tracking sensitivity can be adjusted to your taste. Here is the tracking sensitivity settings. Use this to avoid the autofocus locking onto people or objects passing between you and the object you're filming. Adjustment depends on how long the object will appear between you and what you're filming. The AF speed is how fast it will pull the focus. Here's the test. At first, the quickest setting, plus 5. Then at normal, at zero.
and the slowest, minus five. I normally use something between zero and minus two, but it all depends on what you're shooting and how fast it moves. Remember that you have to start the recording for these settings to kick in. Before starting the recording, the autofocus is really snappy and too quick to look cinematic. So have this in mind if you shoot with an external recorder. If you start recording on the external recorder, the camera will not notice this and the autofocus will look horrible. Just select trigger HDMI and record only to HDMI and not to SD and trigger the recording on your external device using the shutter button on your camera. Then you should be fine. The camera body outside is very similar to the X-T2. The major differences are the eyepiece is protruding just a tad more, helping you not touching the screen with the nose. The diopter adjustment now has a lock, similar to your watch crown, which you can pull out, adjust and then push it back into lock. And there is implemented a tally light, fully customizable, both in front and in the back. Connection-wise, Fujifilm again show that they are listening to the customers. An in-body headphone jack that on previous models only have been in the additional battery grip. Now we have a micro HDMI, USB-C port for image transfer and battery charging, headphone jack and a microphone jack. If you shoot a lot connected to these ports or with the camera cage, one cool feature is that the left side door can be detached. Way to go Fuji, cool feature. No more worrying about breaking this door. On the opposite side, we have the port for the remote shutter and dual SD card slots, both compatible with UHS-2. I recommend, as Fujifilm, to use cards with a video spec class of V60 or better to record movies at a bitrate of 400 megabits per second. I'll leave a link to the cards Fujifilm recommends in the video description. On the top, the dials have been changed slightly, with bigger drive dials and a slight angle on the shutter, ISO and exposure compensation dial. The weather sealed body made from magnesium alloy feels sturdy and size wise it's only about a millimeter taller and thicker than the X-T2. The clearly visible dials on the camera body is what so many like about this camera. Everything is just so easy accessible, including the f-stop ring on the lenses. I just love this design and functionality. The camera also has a bunch of customizable buttons. Almost all buttons can be adjusted to almost anything you like. There is also a My Menu option in addition to the Quick Menu that you can put all your most used settings in. The viewfinder is really big at 3.7 million dots with 100 frames per second refresh rate. The rare 3 inch screen that is now also touchscreen can't be articulated and flipped forwards but 90 degrees upwards, 45 degrees downwards and if you shoot pictures low in portrait mode sideways like this. New is also the night vision mode which is less disturbing if shooting in dark conditions. File sizes, you may take 40 megabit per second is all great. For recording the most information it's great, but storing the files you also have to have in mind the sheer size of these files. 400 megabit is 50 megabyte per second. Remember megabit has a lower B and megabyte has an uppercase B. So 50 megabytes per second results in 1.5 gigabytes per minute when recording at 400 megabits. My test shows its bitrate is slightly above 400 megabits as my test shows 1.55 GB per minute. When recording externally, the newly available Atomos Ninja 5, or V as I like to call it, sounds much better, will probably for many be the choice for monitoring and, and external recording possibilities. I ran some tests to see what the file size would be. The Ninja V records in either ProRes or DNX HR. ProRes is a great codec for editing, much better than H.265. The file sizes was 6, 8 or 12 GB per minute, depending on selecting the compression LT, 422 or 422 HQ. That's massive files. But as of now, before Fujifilm releases the new update to the X-T3 later this month, in December 2018, this is the only way to record bigger file sizes than 4 GB. As of now, the files will be cut at 4 GB and the new file will be stored. This is no problem as there are no frames missed, but you have to put them all in line in your editing software afterwards. But as I said, this is addressed in the upcoming firmware. The new firmware will also incorporate 4K HDR video recording in hybrid log gamma, HLG, compatible with all intra and maximum bitrate 400 megabytes per second with H.264 and other small adjustments. Fujifilm is really great at constantly putting in new features in their cameras. So let's go over to image quality. 
in my previous XH1 review, I praised the video quality quite high, except the 120 frames per second option, the Moray and Jagis was, at times, pretty high. In the X-T3, they have a heavier crop in 120 frames per second at 1.29. Unlike the X-T2 and the X-H1, it isn't upscaled. The X-T3 can record 100 or 120 frames per second in Full HD in both 8 and 10 bit. The recording is automatically slowed down internally to your choice from 24 to 60p. So, is it improved from the XH1? Let's see in these examples. When stationary, the XH1 doesn't look so bad, as I only was on the slider in this case. There are some moray in the XH1 shots, and the fine details show some kind of noise, just making the picture not so pleasing to look at. But as I said, the differences are not so visible in these test shots. I have found no big issues with moray or noise as in the XH1 on the XT3. The 120 frames per second also looks quite good upscaled to 4K as in these examples. So, an illustration of the differences in the crop at 120 frames per second at 1.29 crop, in 4K 60p at 1.18 crop, in 4K there is full sensor readout when shooting under 30 frames per second. This is all shot on a 16mm lens for reference. One of the high selling points and what Fujifilm is known for is its color science. All the way back in the film days, they have made some awesome films with great colors. In the mirrorless cameras, there's no difference. Looks great. Here is a short run-through of the film simulations available. Pruvia Standar, Velvia Vivid, Astia Soft, Classic Chrome, Proneg High, Proneg Standard, Eterna, Acros, Monochrome, Sephia. For video, the Eterna is my favorite. If you would like something else, the Proneg standard is also a good option for video. But if you have extremely contrasty scenes, you might want to go with a log recording. Fujifilm offers the possibility to record in F-Log format, which is free and already installed, as opposed to for instance Panasonic, where you have to buy their V-Log license in addition to the camera. You can then grade the picture manually in post or use the F-Log to Rec. 709 or F-Log to Rec. 709 Eterna lot from Fujifilm. The look will then be similar to the wonderful Eterna look, but it will have a greater dynamic range to play around with. You just have to do some more adjustments than with recording straight to Eterna in my experience, as you normally expose F-Log as close to clipping the highlights as possible. Just remember that the base ISO will be 640 when recording F-Log. The base ISO has also changed from 200 to 160 from the X-T2 to the X-T3. You definitely need a strong ND filter if shooting at larger apertures in sunlight, as the base ISO is this high in F-Log, but this is nothing special for Fujifilm. The log base ISO is normally higher than the base ISO. The F-Log base ISO was 800 on the X-T2 and X-H1, so it's definitely easier to keep your shutter at the 180 degree rule with the X-T3 on a sunny day. So, one issue you might run into when shooting digital video is rolling shutter, most noticeably when panning or something moving through the frame. The X XT3's sensor read speed is about 1.0 times faster than previous models, which enables as fast as 17 milliseconds sensor readout in 4K 60p. The rolling shutter distortion has been reduced quite a lot. Here is the XT3 and the XH1 compared. See how much the XH1 distorts the straight lines compared to the XT3. The XT3 handles the rolling shutter really well. So, what's the XT3 missing? Frankly, not much. The thing that comes to mind is IBIS in-body image stabilizing. You can get away handhold if you have an optically stabilized lens like the 18 to 55 shown here, but you are better off with, for instance, an XH1 if you mostly rely on shooting handheld. But if locked down to a tripod, slider or a gimbal, you'll be fine. The other thing is battery life. For my type of shooting, I normally have no problems with this battery size. But if you shoot a lot and especially longer clips uninterrupted, this could be an issue. If so, I recommend getting the battery grip. The NPW126S is rated at 40 minutes 4K video at 29 frames per second or 390 shots. This is slightly higher than XT2 because of its more efficient quad-core processor. My suggestion is to get a couple of extra batteries and you're good to go for the normal average video shooter. One extra new feature is that all the boost mode functionalities is now available also without the grip. So, if you don't need extra battery life or need it for ergonomic purposes, there is now no other reasons for getting the battery grip.
Editing H.265 on your computer can be a challenge if your computer is not up to spec. On my MacBook Pro, the H.265 files lag up my machine and playback before rendering is a pain. Just look at this playback. You can see the frame changing only every 4 to 5 seconds. There is no smooth playback. Here's my computer specification just for reference. After you render the files, it plays back OK, but not before. I recommend a high spec computer or shoot externally in ProRes or convert to ProRes before editing or just edit with proxies. H.265 is a highly compressed codec but good quality but not meant for editing in the first place. Just have this in mind if you plan to shoot a lot in H.265 10-bit files. The H.264 8-bit files runs smoothly on my computer but this is no fault with the X-T3. It's only that H.265 is a processing demanding codec. So the question many might have, XH1 or X-T3? Quick and easy answer from my point of view is XH1 if you don't do any major color grading, don't shoot at higher frame rates and mostly shoot handheld. For everything else, XT3 all the way, definitely. So it's time for a summary. The positives. Fantastic image quality both in video and stills. 4K 60p 10-bit 420 internal recording. 4K 60p 10-bit 422 externally simultaneously as recording to SD card. Really good customizable autofocus with widely spread focus points and face and eye detection autofocus in video. Good 10 bit 120 frames per second slow motion, improved over the XH1. Fujifilm's intuitive camera layouts, extremely customizable buttons for your own shooting style, Eterna color profile, great for video, and it's really compact and light. So, the cons no abyss, battery life could be better, but not a big problem. H.265 codec is demanding on your computer for editing and playback, but this is, as said, not the camera's fault. So, I hope you enjoyed my review. Remember to subscribe and tick the small bell if you'd like to see more reviews like this. Comment if you have any questions and I'll be more than happy to answer them. And lastly, will I personally be switching from the X-T2 and X-H1 to the X-T3? Yes, definitely. Cheers from Norway guys and see you soon.